Good morning, Bethany Church. Wow, we got, got sound this morning, right? Um, and good morning to all those uh, tuning in on Facebook and Zoom. It's great to have you here, and we thank the Lord for another beautiful day with mild temperatures and clean air. And we look forward to worshiping with you today. Today, I want to uh, mention a few announcements. The, the remodeling in the bathrooms is continuing. You can, you're free to check on the progress if you like. Uh, this coming week, we'll be getting in the uh, plumbing and electrical work. And next week, we'll meet outside again, uh, weather permitting. And then our plan is to start meeting inside in two weeks on November 1st. And we'll also start up the Nichigo service again in the Koinonia room. Uh, and most of the studies are now meeting again in person. The, the Nichigo study on Wednesdays and uh, two English studies on Thursdays. And you can also join those by Zoom. So we encourage you to do that if you don't feel safe in coming out yet for the studies. And I was just informed that uh, a senior lunch has been scheduled for Thursday, October 29th. That's not on the announcements yet. But that'll be Thursday, October 29th at 11 a.m. And if you cannot attend, we'd like to deliver a lunch to you. This is for the 55 and over group. And so please RSVP to Jan and Derek, uh, whether you'll come in person or whether you'll be at home and take delivery of a lunch. So, uh, and we have our uh, prayer, prayer list here as well. And so I wanted to see if anyone had any updates, prayer, requests or answered prayer, testimony that you would like to share? Yes. John Slagle will be going in for a checkup on Tuesday. Oh, okay. Um, John Slagle will be going in for a checkup on Tuesday. And there's a possibility he'll have another procedure down the road um, in a month or two uh let's see also um yurika honda is returning today so uh, honda. honda sorry <laughs> sorry honda and uh, it's been great uh, visiting with her and she'll be returning to iowa today right after the service so she and derek will be cutting out uh, before the fellowship time. And any other announcements? Um, okay, no more announcements or prayer requests. And today we're praying for Ramabai Mukti Mission, which is in India. And India has been hit pretty hard with the uh, COVID virus as well. And um, it's also becoming more and more difficult for missions missions to work there and missionaries to work there and uh, harder to get work permits harder to get visas and so please pray that the gospel will continue to spread in India so let's go to prayer okay <clears throat> Lord we do thank you for your beautiful creation and the chance to worship outside in this nice weather today we thank you Lord for the freedom we have to worship. Lord, we, we do pray that you would just guide every part of this service and that you would prepare our hearts and just help us to focus on you this morning and to put away the cares of the world and our concerns and that you would just give us perfect peace and open hearts to receive what you want to teach us today. Lord, we lift up the Ramabai Mukti mission and pray that you would use that group for your glory, that you would give them opportunities and open doors, and that they would have much spiritual fruit. We pray that you would supply all their needs. We pray for your protection upon the leaders and the participants and the schools. 
and just pray that you'll continue to use that group to spread your gospel throughout India. And we pray for the whole country of India. We pray for those who are being persecuted for their faith, that you would strengthen them and uphold them and protect them and that your gospel would continue to go out throughout India. And Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters today that need your healing touch and protection, uh, baby Canaan and Janet and Bobby, and we pray for Alyssa Carmahone, who still needs uh, healing touch from you, and Lucille and Jean and Aaron Gray and we pray for John Slagle that he'll have a good checkup and uh, doctors will have wisdom about further procedures for his heart. And we pray for your continued healing and protection for Allison and for Amina. And we pray your comfort on the families of Ella Kikuchi and Grace Okamoto. Lord, we pray for all our ministries during the week that you would just use them to help us to grow in you and that you would help us to grow as a church. So Lord, we again put this time of worship into your hands and may you be blessed and glorified through all we do. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, we are going to start with praise and uh, worship now. So you are free to join in standing or sitting, and the words are in the uh, bulletin. Okay, this first song is, You're Worthy of My Praise. The men will do the lead and the women will echo and we'll sing the chorus together. First verse is in English and then Japanese and then in English again. I will worship with all my heart.
Amen. How true it is. He alone is worthy of our praise. And now, dedication of our hearts and hands to the Lord. As we sing, give us clean hands.
Jesus, we are so thankful that you shed your blood and gave your life for us to take away our shame and take away the penalty of our sins, to give us eternal life. Oh, Lord, we worship you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Derek's message today is from Romans 3, verses 21 to 28. So I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, Romans 3, 21 to 28. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Good morning. Good to see everyone this morning and worship.
together with you. And uh, last week, uh, you may remember that Pastor Chuck shared with us a great teaching from Psalm 139, and he reminded us that all lives, all of us, matter in the eyes of God as he created each one of us uniquely in his own image and for his sovereign purposes. Now this week, we're going back and looking at some of the the tough questions or tough statements that Christians uh, are sometimes presented with. And one of the ones that we commonly hear, I think, from people who are a bit skeptical of the Christian faith is, you know, I won't become a Christian or I won't go to church because, you know, the church is full of hypocrites. Anyone else hear that before? So as we consider this topic this morning, please join me first in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, just for another beautiful day that we can gather together in this place and worship you, Lord. And we just thank you for bringing us together this morning and um, both here and online. And thank you for this time, this Sabbath day, that we can come and worship you. And Father, we thank you for your word and how it continues to speak to us. And we just ask, Lord, that you would uh, be with us this morning as we look at your word and as we look at this subject of hypocrisy in the church. And help us, Father, we pray. Uh, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and be our teacher and that you would illuminate your word to us today. And so we do lift this time up to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So many who are skeptical toward Christianity will say this. Yeah, you know, I'm just not going to bother with Christianity because the church is full of hypocrites. And all these surveys uh, that these various groups have taken have shown that this is actually one of the top reasons that non-believers or non-church people will give uh, for not going to church or not stepping foot in a church because they look from the outside and say, well, they're just a bunch of hypocrites and I'm not going to go there. Now, uh, those of us who call ourselves Christians, right, we should be living our lives, lives that reflect uh, having been transformed by the Holy Spirit, right? That's the ideal that we should be living these lives. This is what the Lord desires for us as Christians, that we might be a witness to him in the world. Um, Matthew five sixteen tells us in the same, Jesus said this, in the same way, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven. So we're called to be bearers of his light and that our light would shine so that other, it would be attractive, right? This is in a perfect world, all Christians would reflect Christ and bring glory to God through all of their actions, right? That would be kind of in a per perfect world. Now, let me ask you this though. Do we live in a perfect world? No, I see people. Does anybody think we live in a perfect world? No. I think we all know the answer to that question. The fact is that we live in a rather broken world and we are broken people, right? In Psalm 14, 3, we read this. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. And so are there hypocrites in the church? The answer to that, I think, is yes. It's not something that the church is proud of. It's not something that the church condones. Um, Ravi Zacharias once said, the Bible's condemnation of hypocrites is clear, and the Bible also clearly pledges that God will judge hypocrites. He went on to say that God is more angered than hypocrisy than we will ever be. And hypocrisy really is a poor witness to our faith when there are people among our fellowship who act in a hypocritical way. It becomes a very poor witness to the faith. John Ortberg shared this illustration. And I don't know if any of us can relate to something like this. If any of us are convicted by something like this, I was to an extent. Sorry, I couldn't hear oh. what you said. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, this thing is, it's, pardon me, this technology these days, I should have worn just a, one of those old-fashioned watches. Anyways, 
A man is being tailgated by a woman who is in a hurry. He comes to an intersection, and the, when the light turns yellow, he hits the brake. The woman behind him goes ballistic. She honks her horn at him. She yells in frustration. In no uncertain terms, she rants and gestures. When she is in mid-rant, someone taps on her window. She looks up and she sees a policeman. And he invites her out of her car and takes her to the station where she is searched and fingerprinted and put in a cell. And after a couple of hours, she's released. And the arresting officer gives her her personal effects, saying, I'm very sorry for the mistake, ma'am. I pulled up behind your car when you were blowing your horn and using bad gestures and bad language. And I saw the What Would Jesus Do bumper sticker, the Choose Life license plate holder, the Follow Me to Sunday School window sign, and the Christian fish emblem on your trunk. And I naturally assumed that you had stolen this car. So... The world gets pretty tired of people who have Christian bumper stickers on their car, Christian fish signs on their trunks, books, Christian books on their shelves, Christian sta listening to the Christian radio station, you know, jewelry, um, et cetera, et cetera, videos and magazines on their coffee table, but don't actually live out this life of Jesus in their bones or the love of Jesus in their hearts. So I think that's one thing that should be convicting to us as the body of Christ, that we're called to be that good witness out in the world. If we call ourselves Christian and we're a kind of card carrying Christian, then that should reflect in our daily lives. And it really is a bad witness when it does not match up. But unfortunately, it seems like more often than not, the skeptics and the cynics of the church, they tend to focus on the one or two bad examples, right? We hear of something like this, but we don't hear of people in the church who do volunteer work and people in the church who are out feeding the poor and people in the church who are going out and doing community service. We don't hear those things because it seems like skeptics pick on the negative of the Christian faith. Now, if one looks at the people who are part of the Christian church, let's face it, if somebody scrutinized each one of us here, I'm sure they would see sin. I'm sure they would see hypocrisy. I'm sure they would see examples of discord or fighting amongst one another. But we don't go to church, right? Folks, we don't go to church because we are problem free. We don't come to church because we are perfect people. Does anybody want to raise his or her hand and say, no, I'm, I'm perfect. I'm totally sanctified. And no, we come to church because we are broken. We come to church in our brokenness, in our need. Jesus himself said in Luke 5, 31, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. So Jesus came for those who are sick. Jesus came for those who need a savior. Now, in his epistle to the Romans, the Apostle Paul reminded the Roman church that the central message of the gospel is not about looking at the works or the actions of the people of God, but rather it's about a God who redeemed us by giving us his son, Jesus Christ. And this text that Pastor Chuck read for us shows us that all of humankind, everyone here in the audience, me, everyone behind me, all of us are sinful. But the good news is that we worship a God who offers us a gift of salvation that we do not deserve. And so let's think about that first thing. All of humanity is sinful. So for the skeptic who says, well, you know, I'm not going to go to church because all those people are hypocrites. No, all of humanity is sinful for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We read in verse 23. And if we go back to verses 21 and 22, Paul talks about God's righteousness in relation to the law that was handed down by God in the Old Testament. He presents the concept that God's righteousness was made known through Jesus Christ apart from the law. So even those who carefully sought 
to follow the law point by point, they're not, may, they're not righteous because of all the works that they did, because all of humankind are sinful, both Jew and Gentile. And so because of our sinful nature, it's simply impossible for us to live according to the law. We, can, we just can't, if we go back to the Old Testament law and try to follow each one of the things that's outlined there, we're just not going to quite make it. I just I, uh, uh, remember my grandma who grew up in Boyle Heights. She said some of these uh, Jewish folks who she said she would walk out on a Saturday on the Jewish Sabbath and she said, there would be dark houses and uh, these elderly Jewish women say, oh, little girl, little girl, I'll give you a penny and uh, to come and turn their lights on and light the stove because they were trying to follow the law. But so if they could get a Gentile girl to turn their lights on and light their stove, they could cook and do stuff on the Sabbath. So that to me is an example showing that you just, there's no way you could, follow all of these points of the law so that we cannot be righteous made righteous by the law and i think that's what paul is saying here and as i was preparing for this message i was reading some articles on the internet from various um, christian apologetics groups and one particular group addressed the question of hypocrisy in the church and uh, they brought up this very question. They said, well, if someone uh, said to you, I will not become a Christian because of all the hypo hypocrites in the church. Well, how can we answer this? And this was a bit of a tongue in cheek answer, but it says, well, we'll be glad to move over. There's always room for more. But I, even though it's a bit of a tongue in cheek answer and probably not something you would want to say, right at first to somebody who's skeptical, it does drive the point home. In 1 John 1, 8, we read, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And it's not always an easy thing to bring, you know, kind of lead people to the point of say, of admitting or of, you know, kind of recognizing that we are all sinners, right? Because, you know, well, gee, I pay my taxes. I'm honest. I'm a good citizen. I do volunteer work. I donate to charity. Well, I'm not a sinner. I don't steal. I don't murder. And, you know, it just, it's easy for us to think that, well, gee, I'm not a sinner. I don't do and certainly these things that I just spoke of, these are all good things to be a good citizen. But no matter what we do, that's just not enough. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But I think there, in a sense, there's a real freedom in my mind that when we come to the realization that we are all sinners and we all fa fall short and we're just never going to hit the mark, I think there's a real freedom because... We, re we can come to the realization that it's not by our might or our power that we can be made righteous, but rather we are in need of a savior. We're in need of someone to pull us out of this pit of sin. And this leads me to the next verse, which teaches us that we are justified by God's grace. We're justified by God's grace in verse 24 and, and, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now that word justified um, may be a little bit confusing to some people. What does it mean when the Bible talks about justification? It sounds like a kind of a, a, a lofty term perhaps, and it can be essentially defined as being made right with God, being made right with God. Uh, now, there's another version out there, Bible version. There's tons of Bible versions out there these days, but there's one called the Common English Bible that was put together by some of uh, my professors at Fuller Seminary, and it's written to kind of a lower grade level, but it renders verse 24 as this. I thought it was interesting. But all are treated as righteous freely by his grace because of a ransom that was paid in Christ Jesus. So they kind of 
switch justified that all are treated as righteous so that we're made righteous. So we cannot make ourselves right with God on our own accord, right? Because we're all sinners. And so it's God who, and God alone who can make us right with God. And friends, let's face it. The church is made up of flawed, sinful people. And sometimes the skeptics looking from the outside focus on these flaws and focus on what's bad or what's negative about what they see in the church. If they see infighting, if they see different things or ills in the church, I think that's what kind of can turn people off to coming to church. I just remember being part of a church when I was in college that was almost cult-like, you might say, to an extent. And I had friends who had never gone to church before in their lives, and they were drawn into this church. And unfortunately, because of the way that some of the people acted toward us or them in the church, they were totally turned off from church. And I know some of them who have left and still are unchurched and still are out of the church and really were put off by it. So that's very unfortunate. But we recognize that even though we are a flawed people, or in spite of the fact that we are a flawed people, what draws us together, what brings us together every Sunday? Is it, to, is it for us to come together every Sunday and pat ourselves on the back and say, well, gee, we're just great Christians. No, I think what draws us together every Sunday is that we come together to worship God, right? And we come together to worship a God who in his grace gave his only son, Jesus Christ, for the redemption of our sin. And that's the good news of the gospel message that we can share with those who have not yet heard, with those who are skeptical. I think we have to come to the place where we can admit that church can be a messy place. And maybe sometimes it's true. Maybe sometimes we as Christians have this aura or this air about us that we're a little bit better, you know, or maybe we come off that way towards some people. Well, you're just one of those arrogant Christians. But maybe we have to acknowledge that church is a messy place. It's a place where we can just come as we are and we can and acknowledge that we are all sinners and we are all in need of a savior. It's been said by many that church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. And because of what the father did for us in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven of our sins and we're transformed by the Holy Spirit. And that transformation is a process, right? I think it's a, it's a growing process and we're all a work in process, process at progress. And, you know, we're not going to uh, t- be totally changed in one day, but I think he's, uh, the Holy spirit is working in and through our lives. And we're further reminded of our sinful nature and of Christ's sacrifice in Romans five nineteen. And there we read this for it. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So that's talking about Adam, the, the original sin. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. So by Christ's obedience on the cross, giving up his life for us, the many will be made righteous. Now, going back um, to verse uh, 24 uh, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Going back to that verse, the key word, I think, in this verse is grace. Right. We do not deserve to be made right with God for all the sins we've committed, for all the you know, for all the ways that we fall short. We don't deserve to be made right with God. We don't deserve to be justified by God, but it's in God's infinite grace that he made a way for our salvation. And that's the core message of the Christian faith rooted in God's grace and the good news of Jesus Christ who lived a perfect and sinless life 
and paid the penalty for our sins. And so I hope that if we have skeptics come to us, that we would be able to point them to this wonderful truth, that it's not about us to say, you know what, I'm not perfect. We're, we, are, we all have our faults, we all have our sins, we all have the ways in which we fall short, and we're, we're working on it. It's a work in progress, but what matters is the God whom we worship and the grace, gracious gift that he's extended to us in, through his son, Jesus Christ. Paul once again reiterates that we are made righteous not because of anything we do to earn it, but simply by putting our faith and trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so the next thing I'd like to say about these verses is that we are justified by faith. We are made right with God by faith, not by works, but by faith. So verse uh, 25 whom God put forth as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. And then in verses 27 and 28, let's look at those verses as well. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded by what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So this juxtaposition of justification under the law versus justification by faith was clearly an issue in the Roman church be between Jews and Gentiles. We're in this early phase of the church and you have Jewish Christians who were steeped in that tradition of you know, following the law to a T. And then you have the Gentiles who had just were, had newly been uh, converted to the faith and they, they did not have this uh, tradition of the law. But Paul here sets the record straight and he emphasizes that it's faith, not the law through which we are justified. And I really hope that we would be able to kind of steer or point the skeptic or the cynic to be able to come to a place where Christians are a group of flawed people who put their faith in Jesus Christ, receiving the gift, God's gracious gift of salvation. That it's not about whether Christians are hypocrites or they're not hypocrites. And again, that's not something that we're, we're necessarily proud of, but what we can point them to is the fact that we worship this God who justifies us by grace through faith. And Ephesians 2, 8 summarizes this wonderful gift of salvation that we have in the Lord. For you have been saved by grace through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's a gift of God. Now we've spent just a little time looking about looking at what the Bible teaches about God's righteousness and man's sinfulness. Yes, there is hypocrisy in the church. Yes, there are flawed people in the church. But we come together to worship a God who, through Jesus Christ, graciously forgives us of our sin. And one other thing, uh, kind of on a slightly separate note that I'd like us to uh, remember as, as we may be talking to this people, is that Jesus himself uh, unequivocally condemned hypocrisy. And as we consider this big question about hypocrisy in the church, let's look at what Jesus had to say about hypocrisy. For those of us who call ourselves followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are called to tangibly live out our Christian faith. In other words, not to be too cliche, but if you're going to talk the talk, then walk the walk. And Jesus gave us some pretty harsh warnings against hypocrisy. And I won't go through all of them, but uh, let's just highlight a couple. And one that's certainly very well known is in Luke 6, 42, where Jesus said, How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. And so that's, I think, a good reminder for us that 
we each have our sin, we each have that log in our eye before going around and pointing fingers at somebody else. And then in the Gospel of Matthew um, 24, verses 50 to 51, we read this. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be a weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so I think that's very clear that Jesus condemns those who... The hypocrites, though, I mean, I think there's, that's, that's pretty clear from the Gospel of Matthew. And so as for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, I hope that we would be able to be a good witness to our Christian faith so that others would be attracted, right, to the church. We don't want people to say, well, look at Bethany. They've got a lot of hypocrites. I'm not going to go there. And I, I don't think people say that. But I'm just saying that for us, that we in e- each of our own personal lives, that we would strive to be that good witness, that to be that salt and light just in our workplaces, in our community, amongst our, uh, not, uh, in particular, non-believing friends and family members, that we can just be that salt and light in the world. And I also hope that we would be able to kind of steer those who are skeptic or cynical away from focusing on what they see as the flaws in the church and the flaws of the people of the church and rather point them to the God who offers us the gift of salvation by grace and through faith. And that we were all in that place of needing a savior. I know that I can't earn it and I certainly don't deserve it but it's this marvelous grace of our loving Lord that's drawn me to come to know him. And I hope that it is the same for you. And maybe there are here some here today, or there are some folks who are tuning in online who have not yet come to know the Lord. And you can begin your relationship with him by simply acknowledging that he is your Lord and Savior. And that's really the good news of our faith. And so for those who look at the church and think, well, the church is full of hypocrites, I just hope that we can say, acknowledge to an extent that, yes, we are sinners, but all of us are sinners. But we worship a God who is so much bigger than us. We worship a God who is in his infinite grace has made a way for our salvation, that gift of eternal life that we, none of us deserve it, but that he freely gives to us only if we put our faith and trust in him. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the promise of that you give us this wonderful gift of salvation through your son, Jesus Christ, because of what he did for us on the cross, the penalty that he paid by his blood. We recognize, O Lord, that all of us are sinners. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that each one of us comes from that broken place Regardless of what our story is, each one of us comes from that broken place and that we are in need of a Savior. And Father, help us, uh, for those of us who are followers of you, help us to just be a good witness, um, to be a salt and a light to those who have not yet heard that we would just make Christianity seem attractive but that we would also recognize and admit that we are all, we just don't measure up and that we need your grace, O Lord. May we remember that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as you are able for the closing hymn. Uh, Thank you, Pastor Derek.
And our last song is Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Very appropriate. There's no sin that you may have committed that can't be covered by God's grace if you come to him and seek his forgiveness. So we'll sing the first two verses and then the chorus and then the third and fourth verses and then the chorus. Doxology. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today, this week, and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Please join us for a time of fellowship. Fellowship.